of Bay Area. Um, it's really good to be here. It's really good to see that you have established and um, uh, continuing to worship God and wherever He called. Um, will you join me in prayer, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, we love you, we need you, and I just pray that Lord, you will just use me as a mere vessel and an instrument to just share your word, your truth to your people. I pray that those who have the ears to hear will listen. I pray that those who have faith will um, understand and truly believe what we have in you. All the promises that you gave to King David now belongs to us, your church. So please bless this hour and, and use this time just to fulfill your will. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Once again, I am so glad to be here. A <coughs> different feeling, Luther, uh, Lutheran church, <laughs> kind of a more of a liturgical uh, feel, um, but it's really good to be here. <laughs> uh, what comes to your mind when you hear the name David? Uh, some of you might think of David and Goliath. Some of you might think of David and Bathsheba. Or some of you might think of David and Saul. But today, I would like to focus on David and God's promise to him. Um, in theological term, you might have heard Davidic covenant, which is just a, a theological term simply meaning the promise that God gave to King David. David was anointed by Samuel to be the second king of the nation of Israel. Of course, the first king being King Saul. Saul and David was both king, but they were radically different in personality and reputation in the Bible. Saul was a man after people's own heart, but King David was a man after God's own heart. Saul was a people pleaser, but David was God pleaser. Saul cared for his own reputation, but David sole concern was God's own reputation. David was the youngest of a man named Jesse. He had eight sons, if you recall. When God commanded Samuel to go to Jesse and invite him to be, uh, invite him to sacrifice in Bethlehem, he had all the sons pass through Samuel. Eliab, the first, uh, passed by and Samuel saw him and thought surely this is the Lord's anointed the Lord's anointed is before me and God reminded Saul, uh, Samuel do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I rejected him for the Lord sees not as man sees Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks into the heart. The second was Abinadab. No, God says. The third was Shama'ah. No, God says. The fourth son passes. No. The fifth, no. The sixth son, no. The seventh son, no. Samuel is confused. God, none of the son of Jesse will become the king? Then why did you send me here? So Samuel asked Jesse, is this all the sons that you have? And Samuel says, I mean, Jesse says, well, there is one more, but there he's just tending the sheep. So in Jesse's mind, this eighth son was not even, even in a candidate's list. He was just the youngest son, a teenager, who was just tending the sheep. Samuel says, until 
this youngest son comes, we shall not sit down, we shall not proceed. So Jesse sends the servant and he runs and runs, and I can just imagine what's going on. He runs and David's just tending some sheep, and the servant's out of breath. <laughs> David's like, what's going on? Is there something wrong? And the servant's like, <clears throat> you must come. Guess who's here? Samuel the prophet's here, and he's asking for you. For me? Why? I don't know, but God is asking for you. David is running and running, and David's now going, Dad, what's going on? Why did you search for me? And Samuel looks at David and says, This is the one. God tells Samuel, anoint him to be the second king of Israel. Theologians say he was about 13 years old. Andrew, how old are you? Huh? Huh? You're 12, maybe one year older than you? <laughs> David's 13 years old, teenager. And Samuel brings him to the side. He cracks open the, the oil. He pours it to David's head and anoints him to be the second king of Israel. Wow. What would you think if you just become a king of a nation? But you know what David did? He goes back to tending his sheep, the Bible says. Because he has to wait. Because Saul is still the king. And for years and years, he has to wait until the moment comes where he has to fight Goliath. And you all know the story of the battle with Goliath. No one had the courage to face the giant. But David had faith in God. He couldn't stand this Philistine mocking God whom he loves dearly and serves. David knew God was with him. David knew that God was with the nation of Israel. So with the eyes of faith, he knew exactly who was the giant and who was the dwarf. In the eyes of David, Goliath was not a giant, but a dwarf. God grants him a very huge victory, and instantly David becomes the hero and a celebrity. He becomes a superstar. King Saul couldn't handle that. He was jealous. So he devotes his entire life and the power of being a king to kill David. God protects David. But during that time of training, David becomes the true king inside and out. Saul and his sons get killed, and finally, David becomes the king. After he becomes the second king of Israel, his first move is to restore and make Jerusalem his capital city. And then he calls Jerusalem the city of David, the city of Zion. The second move he does is he brings the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem. And he places the Ark of the Covenant inside a tent. Time passes, God grants some kind of peaceful time for David. And that's where our text picks up today. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 through two. Uh, 1, 2, and 3, it reads, Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of Seder, but the ark of a god dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you all do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, King David sees the Ark of the Covenant, which is in a tent. So in his mind, he's thinking God is living in a tent. <laughs> but he sees his palace, and his palace is just so fancy. A big castle of some sort, made with cedar. The best tree 
that you can find at David's time. So he's thinking, what am I doing? God's living in a tent, but I'm living in a castle. This cannot be, David thinks. So he brings Nathan, the prophet, and he shares his thought. The prophet says, do what's in your heart. Build God a temple. But God had something different in mind. In verse 4 through 7, God reveals his hidden heart towards David and says this, But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in the house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from the Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? God is telling Nathan to go tell David, when did I ever tell you to build me a house? Don't you remember? When I took the nation out of Egypt, I told him to build me a tent so that I could move around with them. You see, God is not just here in this beautiful sanctuary. The Bible says, the heavens is his dwelling place. The earth is his footstool. <laughs> Where is it that you cannot find God? David once tried to hide from God and he wanted to climb the highest mountain, but is not God there? He wanted to hide in the deepest ocean, is not God there? Where can you find the place that God is not there? Nowhere. So many times we think that God is in the church. And when you out, walk outside the church building, God is not there. When you're drinking coffee in a coffee place, you think, maybe God's not here. When you're in front of your computer, you think, maybe God is not here. It's my space, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. This is my phone, my place, and God surely isn't there. God is not in my room. I'm alone. He's not there. But where can you be that God is not? God is everywhere. He's omnipresence, you know. He's everywhere. And David completely missed that. He thought God is in that small little tent. So God reminds David, no David, I'm everywhere. I'm much bigger than you think I am. The reason why I told Moses to build a tent is so that I can build a sacred, a, a very holy place, so that I can move with the people, that I can dwell with the people, that I can live with the people. I don't just live in this tent. <laughs> I live everywhere. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be reminded that God is everywhere. He is with you. Amen. Whatever you go in your home, in your school, God is there. God is there. So, God, David wanted to build a house for God. Now, this is the answer that he gets from God, starting from 8 to 17. God tells Nathan the prophet to go tell David this. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they, will, they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more 
as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie with your fathers, I will raise up an offering as for you, who you shall come, who shall come from your body. I will establish this kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be a father, and he shall be a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of man with the strength of the Son of Man, but my steadfast love will not depart from him. I shall took, I, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. In your house, in your kingdom, shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, in accordance with all these visions, Nathan spoke. To David. This is the promise that God made to David. Now, what in the world does this promise have to do with you? That's the question, isn't it? What does the promise given to David relate to you, to this church? If, it is, if, this, if this promise doesn't relate to you this night, then we might just pack everything and go home. <laughs> but it does have many things, many things with you. Because you are the church of God. And this promise is for the body of Jesus Christ, us. So it has everything to do with us. Not only David, not only the nation of Israel, but you and I. And for those who have faith, if you say amen to this promise, all the promise that given to David is yours. Amen. It's yours. And I want to give you that three promise today that if you have faith to see that this promise can be yours, not only for tonight, but forever. Amen. So first promise that God gave David was grace of God. Can you repeat after me? I'm so sorry. Grace of God. Grace of God. That's yours. And you might think, oh yeah, grace of God, that's good and all. Okay. But you don't understand. Grace is the most powerful, most amazing most wonderful gift that God can give to anyone. What is grace? Simply put, grace is this. A favor from God to those who don't deserve it. <laughs> it's a favor from God for those who don't deserve God's favor. It's a gift from God. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. It must come from God as a favor to his people. That's grace. David wanted to do something for God. He wanted to make a house for God. And God says, no, 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 no. That's not how it's going to work. I'm going to give you grace. David, you don't deserve this, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. So when you read the Davidic covenant, you have this eight great I wills, I like to call them. I will, I will, I will. Who will? God will. Not us. <laughs> not your pastor, not your deacons. But who will? God will. God says to David, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Eight times. Eight times. That's great. <coughs> I will make your name great. I will appoint a place for you. I will give you rest. I will give you a, a house. I will raise up your offspring. I will establish the kingdom. I will be a great father to you. And I will discipline you. I will, I will, I will. God will. That's the great promise that gave to David. I will. God will.
You know, Ephesians tells us that salvation is not from our own work, but a gift from God. It's grace. From the beginning to the end. You can't earn your salvation. And as a pastor, I've been a pastor for 20 years now, preaching 20 years. Wow, I feel so old. 20 years of preaching and counseling and talking to Christians. I find very intriguing that still many Christians don't understand the concept of grace. They still want to earn favor from God. For instance, they have a prayer request. Oh, I, I want to pray blessing for my children. What do they do? They pray to God. Very, very intently, fervently, every day. Oh God, please bless my family. You know what? It's very similar to Buddhism. My grandma was a Buddhist. Every morning, every morning she would pour very clean water and she would pray for an entire family member. I pray for Sangjun, I pray for Hojun, I pray for Duojun, I pray for God. <laughs> Every morning she used to do that. Because she needs to work, pray, do stuff to earn the favors of gods so that the gods can bless. But you know what? Even though you pray 23 hours a day, <laughs> And you read the word of God hundred times. I know this pe uh, person who read Genesis to Mal uh, Revelations hundred times, two hundred times. If you don't have grace, you can't be saved. Oh, but pastor, you don't understand. I come to church every Sunday. Sorry. Oh, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm a Sunday school teacher. Sorry. I'm a deacon. I'm the leader of the church. Yikes, sorry. Because you can't really earn God's salvation. It has to be given by God as a favor. When? When you can't do anything, you try your best to be holy, you try your best to become a good Christian, but you know and I know, trying our best never works. <laughs> oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be the best Christian in the year 2020. I'm going to quit this, I'm going to stop this, I'm going to stop that, I'm going to do this, read the word of God, pray. I'm going to try my best to be a good Christian, but you know and I know trying our best never works. Why? Because we're sinners. <laughs> sinners sin. <clears throat> like dogs go to the vomit. Like pigs go to the mud. Sinners always want to sin. That's who we are. We are sinful. We are sinners, and therefore we love sin. It's natural for sinners to love sin. We are not, we sin because we are sinners. And no one can help us become righteous through our own effort. That's why if you truly understand who you are, you fall flat to the ground, not your own effort, you say, God, I can't do it, but you can. Because God, you said, I will, I will, I will. God, you can do it. I can't do it, but God, you can do it. So you pray to the God who can save you. Not your own effort, but you pray to the God that can save you. You pray to him that he can truly change your heart. You know very well how easy it is to wear a mask. You can fool people. You can fool your family. I've done it. <laughs> I can fool my wife easily. <laughs> Wearing a mask, 
inside a church, pretend to be a holy pastor, wearing a mask, it's very easy, you know. You can fool God, I mean, you can fool yourself, you can fool people, but you can never fool God. You know who you are. You know what you love. Loving of pleasure more than God. Lying, cheating. Lovers of money. <laughs> and you know you can't do it. It's too powerful. The world and Satan and death is too powerful. Are you sure that you can do good things and go to heaven? I've seen a lot of people say this. But pastor, when I reflect my life, yeah, I've done some wrong things. But 20% bad, 80% good. So God's going to weigh it out. So 20% bad, 80% good. So 80% is going to weigh it out. And God's going to say, 80%, that's a B plus, you're in. <laughs> yeah, I lie sometimes, but I've done, I've done some good stuff too. Charity work, church work. Being sacrificial in the family. I'm a good person, Pastor. May I ask you something? What is God's standard? B plus? <laughs> How about A minus? If you have A minus, can you enter into heaven? I'll tell you what God's standard is. A plus, 100%. That means from the time of your birth until now, you have to meet God's standard. And God's standard is this. If you think, and if you hate somebody in your heart, that's considered a minus. <laughs> so, from birth to now, if, you are, if your record is clean, inside and out, you never lied, you never watched a woman lustfully. <laughs> you never cheated. You never hated. And inside out, you're perfect. Okay, you're going to heaven. But if you have one strike, not even three strikes, one strike, you're out. Who can stand before this holy God? And God cannot compromise His holiness because if He does, He's not God. If He allows some little darkness into His kingdom, that's going to spread. So you must be 100% perfect. Now who in us, who in this congregation is 100% perfect inside out? No one. And that's why all of us need grace. Because there's nothing you can do to make yourself clean again. Once stained, always stained. Once a sinner, always sinned. But sometimes I see Christians still confused, trying to earn their salvation. It's grace. And David got it. He understood God would do it. So David says, from this to this you have saved me. From a shepherd to a king you have given me grace. And that's what we receive. From sinner to child of God. From enemy of God to heirs of the kingdom. From total depravity to total holiness. How? When Jesus Christ died on the cross, when he shed his blood, dripping every part of his blood, that covers us. When we had to die because of our own iniquities and sin, Jesus Christ paid for it all. He paid for your sin and my sin. Every single sin is him. So when we trust in the cross of Christ, grace falls upon us. And our sin is wiped away clean. Our, our existence becomes from sinner to a child of God. How? Through grace. Not our own effort. And that's why we boast in the cross of Christ. Because we had nothing to do with it. We can't boast about anything because it was all the righteousness of God. It was all the doings of Jesus Christ. He loved us so much for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. What does it mean to be giving? Giving meant Jesus died on the cross. And that love, that grace, has the power to change people. 
I pray and hope that this blessing of grace will fall upon you tonight and forevermore. I pray and hope that this blessing of grace will fall upon this church from tonight and forevermore. This is the best gift that you can receive from God is the grace of God. Number two, David's covenant was unchanging eternal promise. And I hope this blessing falls upon you tonight and forevermore too. In verse 13 it says, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, what does it mean that God is going to build a house for David? Is he, does it mean he's going to build a fancy palace all over again, a better one? No, he already has a castle. And if you read carefully 2 Samuel chapter 7, you immediately know what it means. It means God's going to establish his heir, his kingdom. Through one of his seed will come the ultimate king, the Messiah, who established God's kingdom forever and ever. It's talking about David's dynasty. David's dynasty will live on forever and ever and ever. Why? Because God's promise is forever and ever and ever. God promises you, and when He promises you, it's sealed, done. Nothing can take that away from us any longer. Human beings, we promise, and we say, oh, I'm so sorry, I broke it. I hear many, many broken promises. I promise I won't do this. I promise you, Dad. Or our children say, but Dad, you promised. We can break promises, but God can't, because God cannot lie. Once a promise is given, settled, done. No one can break it. Remember the promise given to Abraham? We call that Abrahamic covenant. The promise given to Abraham. When he was very old, 75. Well, consider today, 75 is very young, right? But at that time, 75 was considered maybe a bit old. And Sarah, her childbearing period ended. That's the time when God promised Abraham through you, I'm going to make a nation, meaning I'm going to give you a son. Ha! God? You giving me a son? I'm 75 years old. Are you kidding me? <laughs> my, my wife, Sarah E., done. No longer. It's impossible. But God says, but I promise. And strangely, Abraham believes that. <laughs> And when he was about 99 years old, God comes to Abraham and makes a promise again. Do you believe that I'm going to give you a child? And Abraham, he's been waiting, what, 70, 99 minus 75 is what, 20, 24 years? <laughs> he's been waiting 24 years now, and he's tired. He thinks, God, you're going to break a promise. You promised me a son, but... It's been 24 years. Can you wait 24 years? <laughs> we live in an instant time. Like, we live in an instant. We have to have it now, right? Abraham waited 24 years of God's promise. It didn't happen. So God comes and says, Abraham, do you still believe? And Abraham's tired. He's like, no, God. I'm so tired. I think it's impossible for you. You're just saying stuff. So, here's... Uh, Eliezer from Damascus, one of my servants, just make a nation through him, please. And God's like, what are you talking about? I made a promise with you. It's not him. It's going to be your offspring. It's going to come from you and Sarah Eve. And only, amazingly, God, Abraham believes again. <laughs> but the next chapter, chapter 16, we read Abraham and Sarah Eve. They just can't handle it any longer. So Sarah E tells Abraham to sleep with one of her servants. And they just break the promise. They can't wait any longer. And Hagar conceives Ishmael. They failed to wait. If you were God, what would you have done? Abraham, you couldn't wait. So 
you're out. I'm going to start with somebody else. Can God do that? Yes, He can. He's God. He can do whatever He wants. But you and I know that He can't. Why? Because He made a promise with Abraham. And He can't break His own promise. So even though Abraham fails, God doesn't. If you see chapter 17, He makes the promise again. And after a year, amazingly, Sarah, at 90 years, <laughs> 90 years old, has a son. And you know what Sarah names the son? Isaac. Do you guys know what Isaac name means? Laughing. You know why God named Isaac laughing? Because when God told Sarah that you will have a son, you know what she did? <laughs> God, you're so funny. She laughed. And then God's like, Sarah, did you laugh? And Sarah's like, no, I didn't laugh. <laughs> yes, you did. No, I didn't laugh. You read the Bible, it's so funny sometimes. And then, and then she has a child, and then God tells them to name the child laughter, Isaac. I think God is saying, who gets the final laugh now, huh? <laughs> it's reminding us, when God promises us something, no matter what happens, no one can break that promise. God promised, God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, for whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's a promise. If you believe in Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you're going to heaven. That's a sealed promise. And some, sometimes we think, oh no, I'm such a wretched man. I, I, I sin again, I fall again, I falter again. I, I, I abandon God again. And you think that your promise towards you and your salvation is broken? Don't think like that. It's never broken. Even though you can break God's promise, God will never break His promise to you. So trust in God. May the unchanging eternal promise become yours through the faith in Christ. And finally, the promise, the blessing that God gave to David is the privilege of becoming God's child. And I love this. In verse 14, we can read, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. You know what the promise is? I'm going to be your eternal father. Wow. No longer is David an orphan. He's a son of God. Can you imagine that? A son of God. A daughter of God. <laughs> I had a, I had a uh, friend whose father was very famous. He would always used to brag. You know what my father is? You know how much money my father has? And I would say to him, you know who my father is? <laughs> <laughs> my father made your father. <laughs> The 
privilege that we have as a son and daughter of the Most High God is when we are heirs to the kingdom. We are prince and princesses of the eternal kingdom. I don't care who you are, if you're in Christ, you are a prince. Princess. Can you tell the next person next to you today? Tell her or him, you are a princess or a prince. Please tell her, remind them. You are a princess. <laughs> you are. <laughs> you are. You just can't see it yet. But when Jesus Christ comes again, if we're in Christ, we will change instantly. And we will heir, we'll be the heirs of the kingdom of God. That's what God promised. And as a child of God, you can be at peace. In verse 11 it says, I will give you rest from all your enemies. Jesus says, come to me all who labor and are heavenly, heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's the promise that we have as a son and daughter of God. But the most beautiful part is his steadfast love will never depart from us. Jesus says, and behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. God promises us he will never leave us. Never. That's the promise that we have in Jesus Christ. God promised through you, David, one day, through your lineage, your family line, one person will be born, and that person will not be an ordinary person, that person will be God. He will be the Messiah, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus, if you go to Matthew 1-1, uh, you can find Matthew introducing Jesus Christ as son of Abraham, son of David. Promise made by Abraham, promise made by David, even though throughout the historical meta-narrative of salvation, there's times when they were, it was shook, there's times when we, we, can, uh, we doubt it, is the Messiah really going to come from David's lineage? But 2,000 years ago, indeed, Jesus Christ came from the lineage of Abraham and David to fulfill the promise, and he came, and he died, and he was rose from the dead, ascended into the Most High God, seats on the right hand of God, Father Almighty. He pours out the Holy Spirit to his church, and now we can have the Davidic covenant in Jesus' name. If you trust in Jesus, the promise of David is yours. The promise of grace the promise of eternal, unchanging love. The promise of becoming sons and daughters of the Most High God in the name of Jesus is yours. Take it with faith and live it in His promise. Let's pray. Give me a, a